County. Um, tonight we're beginning a, a two-day event called Legacies of Emergency Management, looking back and moving forward. Um, the first part of this event is here and now in Detroit, and tomorrow we are moving to Ann Arbor to the University of Michigan for an all-day workshop. These two places, Detroit and Ann Arbor, have very different relationships to emergency management. In Detroit, where the public school system has been placed under emergency management, <coughs> the water department has been placed under de facto emergency management, where the entire city has been placed under emergency management, communities are very invested in this thing called emergency management, very invested in resisting emergency management, very invested in mobilizing against emergency management, what the Sugar Law Center around the corner has called an emergency for democracy. And this is an emergency that, as I think most of the people in this room know, has unfolded not only in Detroit, but also in Flint, in Pontiac, in Hamtramck, in <coughs> Allen Park, in Highland Park, in Lincoln Park, in Benton Harbor. Um, making, of course, the state of Michigan the national epicenter of this phenomenon of emergency management, um, a, a phenomenon that is disenfranchising communities across the state, and not just any communities. Uh, here in Michigan, the national epicenter of emergency management, over half of black Michiganders have lived under emergency management, while around 2% of white Michiganders have experienced this. So in Detroit, emergency management is obviously an urgent uh, and pressing concern. Things are different in Ann Arbor on the leafy and lovely campus of the University of Michigan, where between our schools and our departments and our institutes and our centers and our colleges, the topic of emergency management has more or less I would say, fallen through the cracks of our collective consciousness. So, while communities across the state of Michigan have passionately been involved in resisting emergency management, um, and some of the people on this panel, have, or, or of course we will hear, uh, have been central protagonists in that resistance, we at the University of Michigan, I think it's fair to say, have been largely occupied with other matters. We're here to try to change that. We're here to try to build a connection between the community and the university. We're here to try to build a discussion and perhaps more. Um, how does the development of emergency management in Michigan intersect with other forms of de-democratization uh, across the, the nation and indeed across the globe? How can histories of emergency management open up new strategies to resist emergency management? How to move from resistance to deep democratization to building radical democratization and co-liberation? And what forms of solidarity might we build to preempt, resist, and defeat attempts at disempowering communities and open to building new communities, beloved communities, the kind of communities that our future uh, depends on. So this, this panel uh, tonight will be dedicated to these and undoubtedly related uh, uh, questions, and it is a mighty panel indeed. I'm going to give brief introductions to the panelists. Um, each of them will speak for about 10 minutes. My colleague, Dr. Zimmerman, will be the timekeeper, um, and then we're going to open up a discussion with, with all of you. So I'll, I'll introduce the panelists now. Um, our first panelist, Shay Howell, uh, has been a community-based activist in Detroit for around four decades. In the course of those decades, she co-founded the Bog Center. She has worked with Detroiters resisting emergency management. She now works with the Detroit, Detroit Independent Freedom Schools and the Riverwise Collective. Uh, as many of us know, she documented the occupation of Detroit during the city's forced bankruptcy in the Michigan Citizen. And as many of us know, she publishes a weekly column uh, in, in the Bog Center, Living for Change newsletter. Uh, she is also a professor of communications at Oakland University. 
Our second panelist will be Mark Fancher. Mark is a staff attorney for the Racial Justice Project at the ACLU of Michigan. He was formerly senior staff attorney at the Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice, which was, of course, notable, among many other ways, for its challenge of Michigan's emergency management legislation in court. Our third panelist is not here. This is Helen Moore. Um, I'm hoping that she will be here, so let's just keep our fingers crossed for that to happen. Our fourth panelist is Louise Seamster. Louise is a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Sociology at the University of Tennessee. She received her doctoral degree from the Sociology Department at Duke University, where she wrote a dissertation entitled Race, Power, and Economic Extraction in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and she's now working on emergency management in Flint. And our fifth pan panelist is Catherine Coleman Flowers. Catherine is the director of Environmental Justice and Civic Engagement at the Center for Earth Ethics at the Union Theological Institute in New York. She is also Duke University's Franklin Humanities Institute practitioner in residence, and she's founder of the Alabama Center for Rural Enterprise Community Development Corporation, which seeks to address the root causes of rural poverty. I'm really excited to welcome all of these panelists here, and um, let, let's begin. Here. <laughs> um, my pen. I, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to uh, come and talk tonight, and I'm especially glad to see folks from Benton Harbor here. I think uh, it's important for us to know that what has happened in our state has happened in virtually every community that was majority African American. Um, I am also grateful for this opportunity because I look around the room and many of us were immersed in, for a chunk of our lives in this fight against emergency management. And I felt as though at times it took so much for us to maintain resistance, to create exciting forms of ways to bring ideas like the wonderful tr uh, trial we had of Snyder and the emergency managers over here in this center, uh, or the documentation of complicated ideas. It took a lot from us because all of us, this like isn't our job, you know, all of us are doing life and then trying to track the emergency manager. And as a result, both the resistance the creativity and the desire to provide alternatives did not really give us an opportunity to step back and ask, what's really going on here? And so that's really where I want, want to center my remarks about what's really going on here. And uh, so I welcome this and want to take that uh, responsibility, at least from where I sit, what I see. And that there are um, three things I want to share about what I think is really going on. The first is, I think we have to understand uh, that we have reached a new moment in the evolution of capital in the United States, and probably globally, but we see it here. And as I have been reading authors around the globe looking at this moment, they are naming this racialized financial capital. And I think we need to keep that new name, it's not so new, but it's a name, that brings forward the dynamics that we are experiencing. That there is a racialized effort around the protection and development of finance capital. In some ways, that has been a big chunk of the neoliberal agenda, and we have understood this as austerity politics. But I think when we look in Michigan, we understand the critical role that race plays in the protection of capital accumulation. And the reason I think, the second reason I think we need to look at that is to understand this moment in terms of the intensity of the rise of counter-revolutionary forces in this country. 
there is a link between racialized financial capital, emergency management, and the rise of Donald Trump, and what that means to our country and literally to the future of the globe. So the first thing I want us to think about is this naming of this moment in a, a more descriptive and concrete way. And the second part of that naming, I think, is to understand the degree to which the emergency management is the latest articulation of control of the efforts of African Americans to assert their own humanity. And I, I don't know, has anybody read this new book by Carol Anderson called White Rage? Have I seen it? It's, yeah, it's a fabulous book. And I, I just, I want to read you uh, just a section. She looks at, at the, the role of white rage, white racism, historically in the United States. And, and this is what she says. The trigger for white rage, inevitably, is black advancement. It's not the mere presence of black people that's the problem. Rather, it is blackness with ambition, with drive, with purpose, with aspiration, and with the demands for full and equal citizenship. A formidable array of policy assaults and legal contortions has consistently pushed back against black resolve. I want us to think about that formidable array of policy and contortions and how much that describes the emergency management experience. And I think particularly, for me, the most dramatic was the fact that the uh, state constitution has absolutely no meaning. When it was incontrovertible that the state constitution protected pensions, and we discovered that it had virtually no meaning at all. So this contortionist motion. So the first thing I want us to think about is this idea of racialized financial capital, how that is a, a new technique in the control of protecting white power, white supremacy, and white privilege. So the second thing that I think, which really struck me when I was reading about this austerity stuff, I was reading uh, Jamie Peck and Heather Whitehead. Whitehead. And she's ta they're talking about municipal finance and financial austerity. And then there's this little half sentence that says, this new austerity program is really ushering in a post-democratic municipal government. And I stopped that a post-democratic municipal government government. And I said, of course that's what's happening. I just didn't name it that. But this idea that democracy is in, as weak, as mediocre, as conflicted, and terrible as it is, it's too much to exist with finance capital. It cannot tolerate democratic decision making. And I think that that is critical for us to think about this polarity between democracy as imperfectly as we've figured it out thus far, and the need for us to then create a new kind of democracy. Uh, and, and, what, and to really understand that, that every democratic decision we make is flying in the heart of these folks who are against us. The, the final kind of theoretical thing I want to talk about is um, I used to think cities actually had some power. I was stunned in some ways to discover how much I actually thought cities could do things. And came to find out through emergency management that cities are, to use their terms, creatures of the state, that we are mere administrative units, that we have no effective decision making over the conditions of our lives. Instead, the primary for, uh, decision making body in the federal system that we exist under is apparently the state government level. Now, 
I think we need to rethink that. I think what has come out clearly in this emergency manager struggle is there needs to be a counterbalance to state authority. And that counterbalance has to come from some respect for the sovereignty of cities. That people in cities should have control over the conditions of their lives as much as they can. And that part of what I think the task in front of us is how do we create leagues of cities that begin to create and demand sovereign power. And, you know, I, did, did you follow this thing with the, the paper bags, or the plastic bags at the state level just this past week? Anybody? This is how petty state government is. They know that cities are starting to outlaw plastic bags, so they made a law to say cities can outlaw plastic bags. <coughs> In other words, at the smallest, pettiest level, they are trying to erode any capacity for democratic thinking, democratic engagement, democratic discussion, and therefore the creation of an authentic democracy. So we have to counter that. And one of the ways to do that, I think, is to develop a, a new notion about cities and their effective political power and to redress the political situation in that area. So th those, are the, those are the things that I am taking away from the emergency manager struggle. Um, I also, the last thing I want to say, um, am I okay on time here? Okay. Uh, the last thing I want to say is um, there are the fact that through the Detroiters resisting emergency managers, what we faced uh, after the emergency manager left here was this last hold of emergency management over the school systems. And it has become very clear to us that even though we now have uh, an elected school board and we were able to get a superintendent, the clear intention is to destroy education for our children in the city and to destroy public education. Not because public education has failed. It is because public education has actually created an effective critical citizenry that has learned things and what we have learned is now threatening to that power structure. So what is happening is public education is being dismantled and destroyed. And here in the city, we now have almost two generations of young people who have had to endure the most abusive kinds of educational experiences as you can imagine. And that's why things like creating the Detroit Independent Freedom Schools or creating any kind of alternative programs that work with young people to develop their critical capacities. Because what I see, and I think what we all see with uh, the ilk of Trump, is that all, all pretense is gone now. There was no pretense in the emergency management process. It was a brutal, disgusting process that actually killed people. And pretense is gone now, and so we need to really do the kind of thinking, the kind of conversation, and the kind of organizing that will enable us to create a real democracy in this country for the first time ever. Well, uh, first, first of all, uh, let me start with a disclaimer. Uh, my comments will not be on behalf of the ACLU of Michigan or any organization with which I'm affiliated, uh, because it's a topic uh, which goes beyond the constraints and the limitations of any structure that exists within the society. You know, if we uh, look at emergency manager at the emergency manager law, and we focus on it too exclusively. Uh, then we miss the idea or the fact that the emergency manager law does not have a legacy. It is a legacy. legacy. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is a weapon uh, that is being used against African people. Uh, 
And so we have to understand that to attack the emergency manager law and to successfully attack it and to destroy it will only mean that we have taken a gun out of the hand of somebody who's determined to get another gun. You know, if we look in Africa in the early 1800s, we will see that uh, the European powers had set their sights on it. You know, the slave trade was in decline uh, if it had not been eliminated, and they had discovered that Africa had much more to offer than just human beings. Right. It had gold, it had diamonds, uh, it had extensive agricultural potential, uh, it had oil uh, that uh, they had not yet tapped into. It had everything that uh, they needed in order to fuel international capitalism. And so the various European countries began to penetrate into the interior of Africa and began to plunder it, began to rape it, began to exploit it, and in the process they began to fight each other. So that by 1884 they determined that uh, it didn't make good capitalist sense for these different European countries to fight each other when there was enough in Africa for everybody. So they convened in Berlin and they put out a big map of Africa on the table and all the representatives of the European countries sat around and carved Africa up like a birthday cake and gave everybody a slice. And for the years that followed, colonialism resulted in the exploitation, the plundering and the rape of a continent and the underdevelopment of a continent to the point where it was completely and totally devastated and the recuperation process is ongoing. Uh, it has never recovered from the depopulation that occurred during slavery and the, co the, co the process of colonization which also resulted. This idea of going into some place populated by African people and taking everything that they have is a permanent chronic aspect of the capitalist system. So that if you look at the city of Detroit, you see that uh, with the advent of the administration of Coleman Young, a period of genuine black power. Mm -hmm. This was an administration that went in and without apologies began to hand out contracts to those who were black. Mm -hmm. It began to make appointments to important political positions to those who were black. Mm -hmm. It began to put into place institutions and processes that were resulting in the empowerment of black communities. You, have, uh, you had the recorder's court, which was one of the few places, if not the only place in the country, where if you were black and you were charged with a crime, you could go into court knowing that your attorney was probably going to be black, the prosecutor was going to be black, the judge was going to be black, and all the jurors were going to be black too. I mean, you talk about a trial by a jury of your peers, that was the only place where you could get it. And this was a place that was run by a mayor who made no apologies about being black. And when he was confronted by those who tried to tell him that he should go a different way, that he should be more inclusive, that he should make way for those who had the money and who were white, then he told them, get out of my city. And so compounding the success of this administration, compounding the, the offense that many people took to it was the fact that he did this without apology and he was branded as being arrogant. He was branded as being uppity. He was branded as being a man who was stepping beyond the limits of what a black man was supposed to do. And when he did this, he committed a major crime that deserved punishment. But the problem with Coleman Young is that they couldn't punish him, no matter how hard they tried. I mean, this man was so bad that by the time he left office, they still couldn't punish him. They had to wait till the man was dead before they could start to make moves on the city of Detroit. And so this created a vision for the people within the city. It, be, it created an understanding of what could be, of what the possibilities and the potential could be, and this was very dangerous. This vision was very dangerous. The people of Detroit were very dangerous and they had to be destroyed. Capitalism needed to retake Detroit. It really did. And so they began to a long-term process, which was no different from the colonization that took place in Africa. What they recognized was that they had to make the city unlivable. And they started nibbling around the edges. I mean, they started with redlining, you know, creating conditions which made it difficult for you to get insurance that at a rate that was you know, at reasonable, I mean, sometimes you pay more for your car note than, I mean, you pay more for your insurance than you pay for your car note. I mean, they began to encourage 
small businesses to leave. They started putting out rhetoric and propaganda that made it, you know, suggest that, make the suggestion that you had to leave Detroit. I mean, they start, tried to promote an exodus. I mean, they came in there, took over the schools. I mean, they began to come in and they started to nibble around. They destroyed the recorder's court. I mean, they made the city a place that was very different from what it had been, and people who were not thinking, people who were not conscious said, the city is in decline, I must leave. And then, to compound it all, what they did is they tried to blame Coleman Young. But the truth crushed the words will always rise again, because the Detroit Free Press in 2013 published an article extensively that said, if you want to look at the decline of Detroit, don't blame Coleman Young. They said that in terms of fiscal management, in terms of administering a city, he was better than any mayor that the city had had. But this did not stop the people who wanted to retake Detroit, and you can understand why they wanted. Look at the waterfront. Look at the fact of where it stands strategically with respect to the entire state. It stands as a hub. It stands as the center. It, it offers incredible possibilities. It, it offers incredible potential for development. But not for the people who were here. Those people had to be run out of town. And so, in addition to making the city unlivable in the ways that we've talked about, they started trying to take the land, you know, the city on land. I mean, they, the, the, we have a land bank now, but the original proposal for the land bank was one which I could consider was just not, was a, a very clear effort to pass land, city on property, through the hands of nonprofits and into private hands mm -hmm. for purposes of exploitation. Right. And then for those stubborn Detroit people, those people who just won't leave, Cut off their water. There you go. Cut off their water. I mean, for tens of thousands of people, people who are poor, people who can barely make ends meet, cut off their water so that they can't stand to stay in the city anymore. Get them out of the way. And for those people who still hang on, for those people who are illegally tapping into water, those people who are still buying bottled water, those people who are still trying to do it, well, foreclose on their houses because of tax delinquencies. I mean, put into place a process for excuse from tax uh, obligations, you know, a poverty exemption. But when they come in to apply for it, you tell them that they have to go home and fill out the application, and when they go home to fill out the application, they find out that the deadline for turning it in was a week ago. A system that has been rigged, a system which is designed to drive people out of the city, and the money which is used now the billions and billions of dollars that are flowing into this city to build the arena and to build everything around it, to build all the things that are happening. The money has always been there, but they couldn't put the money into the city because they did not control the infrastructure. And the way that you control the infrastructure is to get rid of those rebellious voices in city government who are gonna fight you. If you got a Joanne Watson there who's going to stand up and fight you, yeah. wait till she's gone before you start to make your move. Right. If you've got other people on the city council who are fighting, get, wait till they're gone. And then, in fact, what you do to make sure that you've got control, get rid of the entire city government. Appoint an emergency manager who has all power in the city and have him to set up the situation that makes it possible for you to plunge the city into bankruptcy, a city that didn't have to be in bankruptcy. It didn't have to go that way, but they plunge it into bankruptcy so that they get absolute total control of the city, lock, stock, and barrel. Amen. And then, after everything is under control, when you've got a mayor in place who looks like the people that you want to attract, mm -hmm. when you've got a mayor in place who's really ready to go along with the program, then you start sinking billions and billions of dollars into the city and start building it up while you continue to run people out. Right. Oh, people continue to fight. And we've got Sister Alice Jennings here who stood up and fought against the water shutoffs. We've got any number of people here who have fought and fought and fought. But the process is the same. It's not just colonialism, it's slavery. Because we have to understand that if you look at Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, it says that black people are three-fifths of a person. What that really means 
is that at the time that they were negotiating that provision of the Constitution, those in the South, white property people, you know, those who were slave owners, looked around and saw that white people were sparsely populating that region. And when they were talking about how they were going to get congressional representation and apportionment, they said, we come out on the short end. Densely populated North, you're going to get more representation in Congress than we get. We got all these people that we own. They should count for something. We don't want them to participate. We don't want them to participate in the political process, but we do want them counted for purposes of apportionment. So they're each going to count as three-fifths of a person in order to bolster our representation in Congress. This is the use of human beings. This is the exploitation of human beings for the benefit of the owner. If you look at emergency management, you see that you've got somebody sitting up in Lansing who wants control of a city. He wants to control everything is, that's there. And just like the slave owners who wanted to use other people in order to advance individual political interests and objectives, this individual is given the power and the authority through the emergency manager law to allow people in the city to go to the polls and to cast a vote to express an honest democratic opinion about who they want to represent them, to establish a city government, and then this person can go in and turn it all into a charade by saying none of it counts. We're going to have an, one person who's going to run the government. If ever we're challenged about the absence of democracy, we will be able to point to the fact that these people went to the polls and they cast ballots and elected a government. They just elected an incompetent government. All right? It's the use of human beings for political advantage of someone else, which is very much, in my mind, contrary to what the 13th Amendment says about eradicating the badges and incidents of slavery. Because if anything smacks of slavery, it is that, where you exploit a population completely and totally for your own political advantage and to the detriment of the people that you're exploiting. You know, in reaction to this, we have to understand that the people of Detroit have been heroic, absolutely heroic, because the resistance has been constant. And not only has it been constant, it has been effective, because the people knew what time it was. They knew the charade and the farce and the exploitation that came out of the emergency manager process. And what they did is they carried out one of the most successful campaigns, most successful organizing political campaigns that I have ever seen. When faced with an emergency manager law that had to be stricken from the books, people mobilized and they organized and they collected thousands of signatures in order to support a referendum that would have it wiped from the books. They did everything they had to do, even in the face of resistance. So when the opponents, when the enemies stood up and said, well, these petitions that you've had signed, they don't count. Why? Oh, well, because the font that you used in the petitions was the wrong size. Well, rather than just turn tail and run, the people mobilized. They, well, you know, under the leadership of the Sugar Law Center and others, they waged a valiant struggle all the way through the courts, all the way up to the Michigan Supreme Court to get this placed on the ballot. And then at the time that the, that the, the election came and people came to vote, mm -hmm. the returns started coming in in the evening. Right. And it looked like the referendum was not going to succeed because the, all the, the results were coming in from all different regions of the state. And they said, well, it looks like it's not going to succeed. But then the results started coming in from Detroit. Mm -hmm. And everything turned around yes. completely. Mm -hmm. And it succeeded. The, the public act for it was wiped from the books mm -hmm. completely. Mm -hmm. Success, democracy in action. The people mobilized and organized, advancing their own interest as the system is supposed to work. But then, within just a matter of days, mm -hmm. yep. the law firm that employed the emergency manager and others yep. trotted up to Lansing and rushed through new legislation a replication of the emergency manager law, Public Act 436, which was made bulletproof by an appropriations provision, which means that it was not subject to a referendum. There would be no repeat act. 
there would be, it would not be possible to repeal this thing. They put it in permanently. It's vicious. And I think that people who are concerned about the impact of the emergency manager law have to understand that this is war. Absolute naked war. And unless it's approached from that, with that state of mind, loss will all will be the only thing that faces the people. And so that means thinking beyond the limits even of what the system talks about. Mm -hmm. Because we have to even begin to think in terms of the fact that not just the system is invalid and illegitimate, but the entire country is. Amen. Because this country has no moral right to exist. No. Right. This country was established by settlers who came and began a process of genocide against an indigenous population. Territorial theft on a mass level. Right. And then established something that they called a democracy, which included as part and parcel of it slavery. How can that have a moral right to exist? How can something so fundamentally wrong and evil be something that can be reformed? And so we're really talking about revolution. And until we come to terms with that fact, all of our efforts are probably ultimately still born. management since 2012 and um, among many things I've been surprised by I've, I've been surprised by how few other academics are working on this I thought there would be one person for each city <laughs> and um, that hasn't necessarily been the case um, and in fact in October 2015 um, I was told by someone in a nearby university um, working on a survey of local officials um, that they weren't asking about emergency management anymore on their survey because um, emergency managers aren't the hot button issue they once were, and infrastructure and legacy debt are the biggies right now. Oh, well, okay. And as you all know, that was the same month that Michigan finally admitted there was a serious problem with the water in Flint. Um, the type of scenario that anti-emergency management activists have been warning about for years. But the law has persisted, um, even as, as we've been hearing, many people in this room have repeatedly insisted that the law is legally needed, needs to go. And, actually overturned mm -hmm. the, the law, um, even though it was largely responsible for poisoning thousands of children and destroying the city's in whole infra water infrastructure and compounded problems for many other cities. Even though it was clearly targeting black cities and exempting white communities in similar financial institution uh, situations. Mm -hmm. um, this law seems to hit some kind of pleasure centers for a lot of white Michiganders, especially at the top. Um, it reinforces what they want to believe about how politics, economics, and taxes, and deservingness, and particularly black-run governments work. Um, and that has made this law remarkably durable, despite continuing challenges. So I wanted to know what we need to know about emergency management now that it's in kind of a dormant phase, but ready to be deployed again in the next uh, cycle of so-called crisis. And just importantly, how can we tie emergency management into like a national story about race and place and resource distribution, as I think everybody is already doing, which is great. Um, so a lot of writing from my end of things, like the you know the pe the people who are writing about this from from the academic perspective, are have focused on the law as showing Michigan's uniqueness um, or kind of an aberration. But as Commissioner Juanita Henry of Benton Harbor pointed out all the way back in 2010, Benton Harbor was the test tube baby yes. of plans to be implemented elsewhere. And emergency management doesn't just teach us about austerity. It's part of a long history of strategies in Michigan and elsewhere to reproduce black disadvantage, steal black resources, and undermine black power. I feel like that's kind of a, 
uh, a letdown statement after what we just heard. Oh, usually that's shocking. Um, uh, but this is specifically visible once you start making connections about black towns situated within larger white spaces and the extractive relationship between and one of the best ways to see that relationship is by focusing on infrastructure. So we're going to be tracing some of those connections tonight and tomorrow. Um, and we have Captain Coleman Flowers here to, to start making that connection to infrastructural issues more broadly. Um, but I'll start by talking a bit about what I saw in Benton Harbor that might be useful for our discussion. So if you read news articles about Benton Harbor, you'll read about its poverty, white flight, disinvestment. Um, like other majority black emergency management cities, it was publicly portrayed as a drag on the state and on taxpayers. But a lot of people in City Hall and around town weren't talking about abandonment. They were talking about micromanagement and exploitation, right. like hyper-involvement in the city. They saw their resources going the other direction for upward redistribution. City officials also often talked about the social and physical issues of assets of the city. Um, from its access to Lake Michigan and the Paw Paw River to the airport and water plant, but they also knew that the assets made them ripe for some kind of takeover. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, what I've been writing about is how far from being abandoned, um, Benton Harbor functions as an extraction machine for white elites camped just outside the borders of the city, mm -hmm. um, a literal siege starving cities of the resources <coughs> needed for upkeep. Um, profit can be generated in multiple ways through this extraction machine. It used to be through labor. Um, it can also work through taking land. But um, you can also generate profit off of um, what some people are calling ruination um, or you know, destroying assets in order to acquire them cheaply. Um, so uh, uh, one local resident commented early on while I was in Benton Harbor, it seems to me that the people are collapsing the city so they can buy it up for a penny and then sell it again. And so I've spent the next six years refining that, <laughs> what he wrapped up in one second. Um, that's what we do. Um, uh, but, you know, even the harm caused to Benton Harbor, whether um, the polluted land that then got t transformed through public money into a golf course, mm -hmm. or the, um, the effects of whites stripping the city for parks, has become lucrative to people operating the extraction machine. So I've been talking about the commodification of inequality, and I, I owe Commissioner Henry in part for that. Um, you were talking about, um, in, a, in a meeting, that poor Benton Harbor, what, what do we do? We get grants off our stats. And then, and, and that helped me see that um, that these public, the public money was actually coming into white elite's hands on the basis of Benton Harbor's demographics, right. and they were telling me so um, pretty openly. Um, and so, so even even Benton Harbor's suffering has become one more tool to extract profit from the city um, elsewhere. Um, so I spent a lot of time trying to understand the perspective. Of, the, um, of those white folks working around the edges of Benton Harbor um, to try and understand what was going on with emergency management and how it fit into a longer history of how they were interacting with, with the city. Um, and so one of the things they told me was that emergency management, I think this is important, facilitated their access to City Hall, um, which usually they had just worked around or ignored. But they said, now I could, you know, I had a great relationship with the emergency manager, and there were no I did not encounter a single black person who told me similarly, no matter what their position was. Um, uh, a lot of us have been studying emergency management as disenfranchisement of black populations, what it, which it is, but it's also really importantly a, another um, an attempt to discredit black governance. Um, and that, that happens to be, um, and, and the people in black governance happen to be pointing out um, that, that these cities are suffering because other people are taking their stuff. Right. Um, so uh, Dana Kornberg, who's here and speaking tomorrow, has, has talked about the idea of territorial stigma um, to talk about white's demonization of black governance in Detroit's water system. And these stigmatized cities, um, the stigmatization is an essential resource too because it, it, it allows you to have someone to blame for your problems right. yes. and it also allows extraction of resources right. and the uneven development that we were just hearing about from our future. Um, and moreover, that stigma helps discredit officials and residents, whether it's when they're protesting the emergency manager law or complaining about physical symptoms coming from exposure to city water. Uh, 
And, and the theft and harm to black cities' assets in Michigan is perhaps best shown in the various struggles around water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I need to tell anyone in this right. room that. Um, in these water wars, emergency management serves as a blunt force tool to exacerbate what's been going on since black citizens first took office in Michigan right. City. And it comes in the context of larger trends of water dispossession and privatization globally. Um, and, and, and we definitely saw openly that many of the cities uh, under emergency management um, had some kind of discussion around water privatization if they didn't actually have their system privatized. But I, I started seeing another pattern around several majority black cities' water systems. Um, in Benton Harbor, right after they took out a major loan to improve the water plant, a neighboring municipality announced they're building their own water plant. Uh, and so they pulled out of the system um, so that the, the water rates had to go up. An emergency manager let Whirlpool's headquarters stop using city water, that they have to hold another chunk of people out. And people were justifying this to me, saying, um, well, they couldn't take care of their water. We didn't want to be part of it anymore. So I didn't know what to do with that information necessarily. I was like, I'm studying emergency management, not water systems um, at the time. Uh, and then Shay Howell told me in fall 2015 that um, if I was interested in Flint, I needed to be looking into the Carignandi Water Authority. Mm -hmm. And I started to notice the pattern once I found out that Muskegon Heights was also losing its suburban water customers, uh, leading to huge problems. And eventually I came to understand how the KWA was formed and how Detroit's water system was transfer transferred to the Great Lakes Water Authority, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we'll hear about tomorrow from folks like Kirk Guyette and Peter Hammer. Um, and they're both under terms that benefited white suburbs at a large cost and were carried out under emergency management. Um, and so I, I'm, one of the things I'm doing with undergrad students is, is work through the emails that Snyder released um, and track, and also trying to track what's happening right now with the KWA and Gliwa. Um, and only those racial narratives can explain how people accept that Flint should be paying for two water services on the basis of a bond agreement that two emergency managers have been charged with fraud over. Um, but one of the reasons I'm most excited about this workshop is that we're trying to put emergency management into a larger context, not just to understand receivership, but to name the deeper dynamics at play. Um, as an ethnographer, we're always being asked to explain, what is this a case of? And um, over the past couple of years, one of my most generative working relationships is with Danielle Purifoy in the front, who's um, going to be speaking tomorrow, also who's been studying black towns' experience of environmental harm, municipal underbounding, and legal structures in the South. And as we started talking about our respective cases, we wanted to know why they matched up so well. So why, why did northern black incorporated cities created through white flight have so many of the same political experiences as southern black unincorporated towns founded as spaces of black freedom? And why the same narratives were being told about all these spaces? Why was it just as hard to get clean city water in Flint as in Tamina, Texas? Uh, we also wanted to understand how majority white communities weren't being hindered even when they were in the same situation. The few majority white cities under emergency management were not stripped and sold for parts. They experienced this process really differently. And unincorporated white towns are often thriving without what we would call democracy or city level taxation. So this is what Shay was talking about. that. Um, if, if you if live in an all-white town, it turns out people don't really care about voting that much because they know their racial interests are being protected without them having to ex exercise any democracy. So just as they don't want democracy here in Detroit, they don't really care about it as long as they're being um, defended at a more fundamental level. So what is this a case of anyway? Um, we're starting a new project to look at uh, what Charles Mills calls the racial contract and how that structures towns and cities at a base level, below even what we think of as the prerequisites of a town, stuff like voting or taxes or service provision. So tend to throw that away and say, like, let's not assume that a town necessarily provides those things. Um, it means looking carefully at the laws about towns and resources and how they change and who benefits. And it also means trying to understand how emotions and these stories that people tell about corruption and dysfunction and who deserves what, try to paper over those extraction processes that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Emergency management through this lens is not just about austerity on steroids. It's about a longer history of race and place in America. 
Um, and it's all too familiar, even if the individual laws are new. And looking from this angle helps us understand how these problems can be so persistent. And the mechanisms change. As, as Mark was saying, you, you take a gun out of the hands of someone, and they, they're already planning where they're going to get the next one from. Um, they can adapt to new policies. And we really need to understand that if we want to know how to fight back and win. Right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh, my perspective is going to be a little different because I come from a rural background. Although I have lived, I did live in Detroit at one point uh, for a short period of time. Uh, I have lots of family here, but I am from Lowndes County, Alabama, Yay. which is located between <laughs> <laughs> which is located between Selma and Montgomery, which is the home of the original Black Panther Party, wow. uh, and and my. And my and I stand on the legacy of my parents who went before me as community organizers and have built a bridge that I now stand on. But um, I work for the Equal Justice Initiative. Initiative. I don't know whether you, any of you have ever heard of Brian Stevenson, who is the author of Just Mercy. Well, I fortunately uh, am employed by EJI. And EJI, uh, in April, is opening the first memorial for lynching. Uh, to represent, to recognize victims of lynchings in this country that, that have never been recognized before. Also, uh, our building is, is, is going to house a slavery museum. Because as we talk about slavery and put a lot of this in context, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, was the, uh, became one of the centers of the domestic slave trade after they ended the international slave trade. And once it became the center, it, it, it created a lot of wealth for that area. And a lot of our ancestors that ended up here in Detroit during the Great Migration, a lot of them came, were, were brought in. People know about Charleston, they know about New Orleans, but they don't know about Montgomery. And a lot of them were brought, if you go to Montgomery now, there's a street where the, where the river, where the Alabama River is, you go up that street, the name of the street is Commerce Street. And there, there's a street that comes along, that comes out the Commerce Street that's called Market Street. And then there at the, at the Court Square is where slaves were auctioned off. And EJI's building was one of the slave holding pens that existed at that time. So it is, is going to be made into a, what is being made into a museum part of it that will tell that history. Well, the same soils that brought people from North and South Carolina when they went, they expanded westward in order to uh, uh, expand uh, uh, co their cotton plantations because it wore out the soil, mm -hmm. took them to places like Lowndes County. And, and the, the soils are very good because they hold water. But the soils are not good for the treatment of sanitation. Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm here today because I've been waging a fight since I returned from Detroit. I moved from Detroit in 2000. I was actually lived on Jefferson and worked at Renaissance High School. Uh, and when I moved back home, you know, instead of de deciding to teach again, I decided I wanted to be more of an activist and try to see what I could do to change my community, to move it beyond where it was at that particular time. I found out in 2002 that they were arresting people that were poor who could not afford on-site sanitation. In the rural communities, you have to have a septic tank. I'm sure in Macomb County and other areas around here, there are septic tanks too. But there, the septic tanks don't work. And what was happening is that the septic systems were so, so expensive that people couldn't afford them. And what they were doing, if you couldn't afford the on-site septic system, they were placing people under arrest. They were charging, they have put in place a law where they can charge you up to $500 a day for each day you're not in compliance, or you'd be criminalized and be charged with a misdemeanor. Uh, the, the Alabama Department of Public Health is responsible for uh, regulating that. But they're also responsible for training the installers, deciding what technology comes into the state, whether or not you get a permit, and permitting what you put in place, and finding you if that breaks down. So what is happening is that they have created a paradigm where they're in control. They're in control of the entire process. And what they've done is part of the, the story that sounds similar is the way they selectively enforce this, this policy. Mm -hmm. The way they've enforced it is that the people that they were arrested, if you go and look at the arrest, most of the people that they were arrested back in 2002 when I got involved in this, 
were, were poor black people. They, every once in a while, they would arrest a poor white person, probably because they wanted the land. So oftentimes, when, we, you know, when people talk about the urban communities, they talk about it in terms of municipalities, mm -hmm. and they talk about it in terms of, you know, when you have clusters in densely populated areas, but also we, we tend to leave out that rural paradigm, and I talk about that a lot, and Danielle has heard it over and over again. If we, we leave out that rural paradigm where people, because a lot of people think when they go home, because a lot of, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people in here have relatives in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. And so, a lot of people, when they go home, and they see the land, they don't see any value in it. There's lots of value in that land. A lot of people want that land. Because with climate change, there's going to be a major shift. A lot of people are going to have to move away from the coastal areas. That's probably why they're looking at Detroit and Vietnam and places like that. You're further away from the coast, and you have a source of fresh water. And a lot of areas, even California right now, California is losing uh, its groundwater. And it's losing so much groundwater, in fact, in some places the ground is starting to sink because they were taking all the groundwater. And, and last year I was invited to the Aspen Institute. Uh, I had never heard of the Aspen Institute before. They sent me an invitation, they asked me to come, everybody was saying, oh, you know, that's prestigious, you should go. So I went. And when I went there, I started questioning, why did they invite me to come? Because the people in the room were people like Nestle, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Monsanto, uh -oh. even the Walton Foundation. Uh -oh. <laughs> They're American water. The reason they were there, and, and big energy, they were there too, and big ag from California, because they, they have big uses of water. What they were talking about is how to quantify and monetize water. And the message that I want to bring today for people that, because I don't want white people to feel that they're, they can escape this. Because what they're talking about is monetizing and quantifying water for everybody. So at the end of the day, all of us would have to pay. I think that Detroit, Benton Harbor, Flint, Oh, that was, that was, that's just the beginning, but right. you should go to me to Appalachia and go to uh, West Virginia, mm -hmm. where they're blowing the tops off mountains there. Yes. And the people cannot drink their water because the water, people told us when we went there as part of the New Poor People's Campaign, that when they light the water, it burns. And what they're doing, they're dividing the families against each other to get the land. And what they were trying to do, what they were, try, what they were trying to do at the Aspen Institute, they're trying to come up with a policy because a lot of this is in the narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, they have to shape a narrative, because I heard this with everybody that spoke today mm -hmm. about how you shape this narrative first with black people can't govern and blah, blah, blah. Well, they're shaping a narrative, and their narrative is that groundwater and surface water are separate. Mm -hmm. Because there are no policies, they researched it, there are no policies to govern a lot of groundwater in a lot of states. So what they want to do is come up with a policy. I remember when I lived in California a long time ago, if you had oil on your property, you didn't own the oil, you just owned the, the, the land. And they can dig down from somewhere else and drain your, your oil. Well, they want to do the same thing with the water. They were talking about being able to drain other people's wells. They're putting policies in place right now where, because water is life. I mean, if, 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 if you weren't paying attention to Standard Rock, you need to go back and read about it. Because basically what they were talking about is taking it, having control and access to water because water is something that everybody has to have. So what the Walter Foundation is doing and Monsanto is doing, I didn't even know Monsanto was in the water business. What they're doing is, they're buying up land around the world for the purpose of controlling water. And I believe that until when we talk about infrastructure, look at Trump's infrastructure package. First of all, they're not going after the Lyons counties of the world because we don't have a lot of money. But if they buy up, because what they're part, what they're doing, in order for you to upgrade, because I know I have friends and family here, these are some of the highest water bills I ever heard of in my life here in Detroit. Because a lot of the water is being lost because the infrastructure is so old and they didn't upgrade it. Right. So as a result, what they're doing is, is he's attaching, if the, if the city needs money to upgrade his infrastructure, 
You got to partner with a private company. Eventually, they're talking about selling off those assets so that they can have control of it. And what you find is when they sell off these assets, because that's just another way. I think they may not call it emergency management, but it's, it, 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 it'll come with the same result. Because at the end of the day, when they sell off those assets and you can't pay your water bill, at least if you're in a city where people live there and understand that there are changes that happen economically and you can negotiate mm -hmm. and set up uh, and set up payment plans, that's not going to happen anymore. Because with these people, the bottom line is how much money they can make and how much money they can generate for their, for their shareholders. So we have to be conscious and know that these issues that are occurring, it may be happening here right now, but it's going to be happening not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Because water is very scarce. And uh, when Obama was still in the White House, he had a water summit there, and I had the, the good fortune of being invited. And the people that were there at that time, that's when the president was paying attention to the national security people. He was saying, they were saying that the, uh, the number two national security issue in this country was water scarce. So from what I'm hearing today, all of these issues are connected because it's about water at the end of the day. It's about water, even what I'm dealing with in Lowndes County. Is about water. When people think about sanitation, they separate it from water, but water and sanitation are one and the same. Because at some point, hopefully we can get to a point where we can extract mm -hmm. water from what we what we were throwing away as, re as waste. Right. Right. So what I'm doing, just to give you a little bit about, about my work and how it all connects, uh, I think that in rural communities we see the most extreme forms of inequality. Because rural communities are just left out of the equation. Yes. And oftentimes, uh, a lot of places, the infrastructure that you have, you've had it for many, many years. I'm fighting in an area that's never had the infrastructure. And I'm fighting in an area between the Selma to Montgomery March, as, as uh, uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber just said, who visited Lyons County. He said that people come to go to Selma every year to celebrate what happened over 50 years ago. And within 20 minutes of there, people are living with raw sewage on the ground. I am from, I'm representing, I'm here speaking on behalf of people that live in an area where the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty was there in December. And what he saw in Lowndes County, he said, is uncommon in the first world. These are, I mean, the arrogance that we have in this country where a, a president can call other countries the asshole countries, and we got assholes right here in the United States, and they don't even recognize or try to address it. In Lowndes County, we did a, uh, did a study where we actually collected fecal soil, water, and blood samples, and we came back and found evidence of hookworm. Hookworm is associated with poverty. And anywhere you go in the world, you will find, and you find extreme poverty, you're going to find hookworm. When I took Reverend Barber down to Lyons County, he went and saw, he was so moved by what he saw, he had to stop for a minute. I think he went and stood all by himself. And I didn't go where he was, because I thought he was probably crying. What is happening is that we have to fight I think part of this equation now, we, we can't assume that all black people, <laughs> I, I don't know a good way to say this. Say it. Say you it. may look like me, but we may not think the same. That's true. That's right. And some of the people, since we have, since we have been fighting this fight in Lowndes County, the person that, the, the person that I have been fighting the most has been a black congresswoman. <laughs> Thank you. you know, she just issued a statement with the health department saying that they don't need to be concerned about hookworm. The outset it was flawed. Yes. But there's still raw sewage on the ground running underneath people's houses. Yes. I mean, one doctor went there and he took pictures and, and put it on Twitter. People said, is this in the United States? <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with. But on the other side of it, we're working on innovation to try to deal with this as well. I met with a, I'm going to close with this before I pass the mic, but I met with a person who's running for uh, governor. You know, he, I started getting these emails and he was asking me, could he come and meet with me because he wants to learn about this problem. And he said to me, what if I declared a state of emergency? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, you know, because we got to do something. Mm -hmm. See, he was trying to establish a narrative mm -hmm. yeah. to make me think yeah. that he was doing something do to something. help. But he, he wasn't interested in helping. Nope. And he went on to say, I just let, sometimes you have to let people talk. Yeah. And uh, so he just kept on talking. And he said, um, 
Or maybe we can pay them to move. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. I said, pay them to move. Oh, yeah, we have a place in Tuscaloosa. I said who he was. We have a place in Tuscaloosa where we paid people, all, paid people to move out of this area because it was too low. Uh, so maybe we can pay them because they're all renters anyway. I said, they're all renters. I said, where did you get your information from? Well, uh, aren't they renters? I said, no, they're not renters. I said, most of these people bought this land at the, at the end of slavery to keep their families together. That's why it's air property. So they can always have a place to go because they didn't want the families to be separated. So he said, well, I don't see why they want to live there in the first place. Why, why won't they all just move to the city? I said, why won't they all? Because every time he said, I was so shocked, I kept repeating it back to him because I thought he, <laughs> you know, thought he was just trying to see whether, whether I was paying attention. And I said, um, I said, for the same reason you don't want to leave the city and move to the country, they don't want to leave the country and move to the city. So what it shows me, and this is supposed to be a progressive politician, this person is running as a Democrat who has received nominations, uh, uh, endorsements already for some of the most powerful black people in Alabama. That's the problem. But they're not asking the right questions. They're just letting people go along, and they are not, as long as they have access that they think to the power, then they allow this to happen. So I think that what, what I'm seeing is, go, is going on here is that they're paying attention to what happened in these other areas. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to find a way in which they can use these same kind of policies. They, I guess he wanted to float it to see how I was going to deal with it first before he, he decided that he was going to talk to other people. And he could have already have talked to other people about it. I don't know. Because they weren't in the room with me. But the point I'm making is that we're all in this together. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you came here by way of the slave ship or your family came by Ellis Island, or they just came recent times. Right. We're all in this together because at the end of the day, it's about controlling infrastructure, right. it's about controlling water, and what they have been very uh, powerful and masterful at doing is that when they, when they wrap it in a racist narrative, we start accepting it. And once it becomes commonplace in, in Detroit, and Benton Harbor and Flint, then they can roll it out in all of these other areas too that are having similar problems. Thank you. Um, to attempt to be a moderator of this incredibly immoderate panel, which is to say profoundly radical in its history and its politics and its imagination, is impossible. And so, let us moderate together. Um, I'd like to open the floor now for, for, for questions and comments from, from any and all of you. I should just stick to my what I part of what I write to them. But the big problem is what she said. It's our black leaders that no one wants to talk about it and just really put it out front. That's we don't have that in Detroit. Because when it started in Ben Harbor, I said this is going to spread all around. And this is where it is now. But anyway, this is one of the things that uh, when I go down to the Water Board Commission, I have to write things down because when I start to talk, and if I just talk, it's very upsetting to me for some of the things that I'm seeing and people are telling me. And by the way, my name is Freedia Butler, and I'm a community activist. I'm the president of the Second Precinct Community Relations Council. But I go there as a community activist. And I said, as the largest fresh water source in America, I question the charges for water in Detroit. Mm -hmm. It is unfair and it is, is unsustainable for the citizens. As stated in an article written by Alice Gross in the Detroit Free Press, water shutoffs raise public health questions. He also wrote that if the administration wanted the people to stay in the city, they would make water affordable. It is evident that you want people to leave. Where are they going to move? 
No one can live without water, the very source of life. I must reflect back to the rebellion in 1967 and its cause. When one looks at the conditions that created the rebellion, the only visible change that has been made is the Detroit Police Department. In fact, matters have gotten worse. Over 60% of our children are living in poverty. The schools, families, and communities have been destroyed. These conditions are contributing to depression and anger. What, comes, what come out of being oppressed are conditions that lead to rebellion. I witnessed the change in my community after McKenzie High School was destroyed. I saw young people wandering the streets, a neighbor had a chain snatched from her neck during daylight hours by a young man who should have been in school. These kinds of acts will continue, and education prepa prepares one for life. Self-preservation is the first law of nature, and not being able to support oneself can only lead to crime to survive. And I, my granddaughter told me to read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is what I try to do, and I stay before them, and I know they're tired of me coming down, but they only meet once a month. So I make it my business to be there every third Wednesday. And I write, and then I stand before a clock to time myself for three minutes. This last time I was down yesterday, I told them, you're going to have to give me a few more minutes because I have to say more about it, you know, what was going on in my community. So they had someone out of the hundreds of people in Detroit, thousands of people in Detroit. It was when I went to her honors program, they left a message on my machine, that uh, my, on my phone, telling me who I was supposed to contact for any concerns in the community, and that to keep me from going downtown. <laughs> but instead, I did my writing. This, I wrote this in August of 2017, but I was down there again Good. yesterday. Good. So we, we just have to keep pushing, but we don't have black leaders that <coughs> we should have in the city of Detroit. That's the problem. Okay. Well, I think that what we have to start doing is calling people out. I think that one of the, one of the, um, one of the problems that we have, I think, oftentimes is when we respect someone um, or if they have that position, we just let them get away with it. Yes. Um, and uh, just one example, this was, this was not a black leader, but I have a lot of respect for Elizabeth Warren. Oh, yes. I really but I was on a panel with her Monday. Uh, Bernie Sanders did an inequality town hall meeting, yeah. and I was one of the panelists. Mm -hmm. And she was uh, justifying why uh, monies was, was, federal money was given to extend uh, municipal sewer to the, the business owners who were white business owners. Uh, and not extend it to people that lived in a municipality. And she talked about, she tried to frame it, said it was economic development. Sometimes we, and I had to, I cut off, Good. you know, Good. and I respect her, you know, but I had to cut her off because that's, that's I was talking about environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about what happens all the time when the money is given to the business community that can afford to fix the problem and is left on the backs of the poor people to fix it themselves. And, 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 and we have to, no matter who it is, and, and, and I still have a lot of respect for her, but I'm sure she respects me now too because I, I had to tell the truth. And I think that we have to do that more and more and more. I feel there's a group of people that every year go to Selma. And I say Selma because you know, I mentioned Selma a lot. I, used to, I was the first director of the Voting Rights Museum. I actually left the Voting Rights Museum to come here to teach. But I was, my, my concern about that there are people that come there and they go to the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they take those pictures and look like they do so much about voting rights and civil rights and they go back home and they forget what the movement was all about. But I think we have to start calling them out, no matter who they are. So that, because that's the only way if we don't correct them, they'll think they're right and they'll keep doing the same thing over and over again. True. Yeah.
I, I had a question about uh, uh, pushing a, or uh, pushing a message of self uh, uh, sustaining. Um, you know, thinking of uh, the uh, biblical story of uh, the the, uh, the famine in Egypt, mm -hmm. where you had a crisis, right, and uh, ultimately the people had to go to the government to get grain, food. Ultimately, Old Testament, ultimately they got to a point where all their goods, because you know, it's a famine, right? All their goods are gone, so they gave up their land to get grain. And then ultimately became indentured servants. And in a just government, I, I guess that worked out well in the end, but it definitely enriched the, the government. Um, today, um, you know, I, I'm seeing uh, uh, credit card debt is over a trillion dollars, all-time high, uh, outstanding uh, consumer debt. Uh, auto loan debt is now over a trillion. Yeah. Uh, student loan debt is now over a trillion. Yeah. And uh, uh, individuals don't own own their homes anymore, so that you don't have access to that type of that type of wealth. So in that environment, if an economic crisis were to hit. Uh, especially in urban cores, in rural areas mm -hmm. too, but especially in urban cores, you know, if I own an acre of land, I can grow some food. It's hard to do if you live in a high rise. That's true. And so my, my question to the panel is, is what messages of uh, self-empowerment, being self-sustaining, where you're not uh, dependent upon uh, the government, and we, and we should be, we should have expectations that government works for us, because it's supposed to represent us. But, but what messages should we collectively be communicating so that people aren't caught in, in a, a, another recession and in, in, in a worse position than a lot of people were in 2008? Well, let me just talk about the reality of people that are on the ground. And, and, and one of the things that I do get a chance to do is go and sit on the porch with mom and them down in the country and I can see what's going on. And sometimes, because we're doing well, we can't see the situation. Some people are just trapped in this cycle that they have no control over. For an example, uh, one of the persons I was on this panel with is, is one of the senior vice presidents of the UAW here in Detroit. And I know that they tried to organize a union in Alabama and had a hard time doing that. But the reason they can't do it and the reason that the workers are having such a hard time here is because they can go to Alabama and, and, and those factories can come, out of the, come from out of the country, uh, get tax-free money, located in these communities, don't even hire permanent work workers, they're hiring part-time workers. Or they're hiring them through temporary agencies and they're paying them the, the temporary agencies make more money than the, work, than the workers are getting. They're working two or three years, they fire them for anything, and then they bring more temporary workers in there. How can they build wealth? Right. You know, I have, we have a lot of people in my area that own acres of land. They've owned it since slavery. Mm -hmm. However, they came by a house, mm -hmm. and they're buying mobile homes. So they get their, when they get their income tax refunds, if they happen to be working or they have children, they can claim it. And, and get a refund, they can go get that mobile home, but they're not gonna build wealth for that because that mobile home is just like, just like buying a car. When you pull it off the lot, it starts to de uh, depreciate in value. One of the places I took Reverend Barber to was a home where a woman is living off $700, actually, she gets 700 between her, uh, the, for herself and her children, she's getting like $958 a month. 950, that's no money to live off of. When it was, we had a cold, I know it gets cold here all the time, but it doesn't get cold where I am too often. When it gets 20 degrees, everything shuts down, especially going to be that way for two or three days. And we had, some, we had a cold snap for about a week. We even had snow on the ground. When people got their power bills, some of those people had to make a, make a decision between eating and paying those bills. And where we're from, especially in Lowndes County, when your bill comes, when that power bill comes in, it's due on the 15th. If it's five hundred dollars and you pay four hundred and ninety-nine dollars and and ninety-nine cents, they're gonna turn it off. And you don't pay that one cent. You cannot make payment arrangements. So these are people that are caught in cycles of poverty. This woman doesn't have a car. 
her, 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 in the mobile home that she lives in, is leaking inside and full of mold. One of her children is nine years old, is sleeping with a CPAP. That's something that I would sleep with because I'm almost 60 years old. But we're talking about a nine-year-old child. But she's caught in this cycle of poverty where she can't, she said they signed a, um, the agreement to pay the mobile home was a hundred, pay for the mobile home was $127,000. She still owes $20,000 on it. The interest rate is about 11%. And if, and if they came and took it from her tomorrow, they probably can sell it for $3,000. But she has nowhere else to live. So I think that as, as we think about these paradigms, we think about it from our point of view, because we come from a point of, point, point, point of privilege. But a lot of these people don't have credit cards. They don't even have telephones. You know, so we have, they're, they're, what I've told my, my colleagues in the New Poor People's Campaign is that you can't talk about poverty until you go to live in some of these people's houses and see how they live. I mean, everybody doesn't have a credit card. A lot of these people are living from the big thing, I don't know about here, the big thing in Alabama is payday loans. They don't make enough money, so they gotta go get a payday loan. If they happen to own the title to the car, it's a title loan. But that's how people make it because the system, the, the system is set up for them to fail. So if you happen to be fortunate enough to not own a student, not have a student, I have student loans. That's the only way I can get to school because my parents couldn't pay for it. But if you happen to be fortunate enough to not have that, thank God for that. Maybe you can go and help somebody else pay theirs off. But I think what we can't do is we talk about these situations is look at the reality and, and look at it from the point of view from the people that are there. Some of them are not there because they want to be there. They don't have a choice. And if we could find ways, and one of the things that I do, and I wasn't a Bernie Sanders supporter, but I'm about to become a Bernie Sanders supporter, because we don't have to have poor people in this country. You know, we don't have to have poor people in this country. We, the, the, the rich people get everything. They give it to them free and expect the poor people to go and beg for it, or they don't get it at all. So I think that what we have to do is, 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 is as we look at poverty and how poverty is in this country, they, they laid this out earlier about capitalism. Mm -hmm. the, the way our system is set up is to survive off of poverty. That's true. That's true. Because that's where you're going to get the free labor from. Right. When the people go, when the young man uh, who should have been in school because the school was closed and the family is poor right. ends up committing crime and they send them to these private prisons where they get them out there to work free as indentured, uh, another, another form of slave, slave labor. labor. Yeah. So we have to I think we have to be careful that we don't beat up on folk that are poor, right. thinking they're poor because they chose to be poor and because they made bad choices. Sometimes they don't have a choice. Well, uh, you, you, uh, you started with the Old Testament. Let's go to the New. Uh, so uh, Jesus uh, lived in occupied Palestine, uh, you know, with uh, people who were living under, in grinding poverty. Uh, you know, they had their own emergency manager, you know, from Rome. Uh, and so what he did is, uh, you know, he said that uh, we're going to divorce ourselves completely from government. And uh, what was required of those in his community is that everybody put everything that they had, all of their assets, into one pot. And that as they needed whatever they needed, they take from the pot. Right? And there were no poor among them. You know, I don't know that literally that's what we do, but I do think that we have the capacity to begin uh, to stop looking to government to try and solve our problems and begin to look to ourselves. And uh, it is not unprecedented. Uh, you know, the, the first Black Panther Party was in Lowndes County, but the next one uh, was in Oakland, California. And um, the, the nonprofit, you know, social service network that we now know of, you know, where there are all kinds of agencies and nonprofits set up to do all kinds of things. Uh, when the Panthers were around, there was no such thing. In fact, the Panthers were the ones that, that set the model, that established the model by establishing breakfast for children program, sickle cell anemia screening, uh, ambulance services, uh, medical assistance, uh, schools, all of these things that they did just by looking to the resources of the community. Uh, because the community had bought into it, the community was prepared to sacrifice for it because they saw the benefits to them. And so I think uh, we still have that capacity. Uh, we have the ability to turn to ourselves 
But I think a little bit too much of our energy collectively is spent trying to persuade people in government to do things that they're never going to do anyway. If that energy were directed toward just saying, we've got to take care of business ourselves, I think we could do a lot. I think about a lot and I kind of vacillate wildly between two polar opposites in my answer. Because um, on the one hand, um, in, in Detroit, in places like the Boggs Center, you see um, experiments in radical autonomy happening and, and being built and, and it seems really important and, I, and I, I agree that, you know, we are beating our heads against the wall um, mm -hmm. when, when the solution does seem to be especially in, in coming um, climate change, like that we are going to need to start to kind of like make new ways of relating to each other and make ourselves more sustainable and that means bringing more stuff inside and, and making more stuff for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I also feel like um, there's this neoliberal push to on those same communities to say, you need to be more resilient, you need to build your own wealth, you need to participate in capitalism by being your own entrepreneurs. At the same time, they're taking all the stuff that people have. And so, like, I, I, I worry sometimes about us buying into that narrative that as, as we all, as all the, the people, as everyone in, like, rural Alabama and in Metro Detroit is paying into this tax system and not getting anything out of it, they're still expected to make their own way. That's the same thing as, as back in the day when you had to like pay for the public school system that was only for white children and then also pay for a black school, like separately on top of it. And so like I worry about us um, kind of accepting that the public is just not for poor folks or people of color anymore and and um, and and just walking away. So, cause, so like I said, it's completely incompatible, and I, I don't know what, what the deal is. The other thing I wanted to mention is I've been um, studying debt a lot, so I appreciate you bringing that up. And one of the things I've been looking at is how, um, if you're a wealthy white person, like some people we know of, um, you can get a $500 million, $500 million loan one day um, just for asking for it, or, or maybe some other things I don't know about what you're trading for that. But, um, Nobody bats an eyelash. And so like we talk about these small payday loans that have a huge impact on people's lives and can and be crushing for them, but we're not putting it in the same conversation as this, you know, larger financialized world of debt where you know the people at the top are heavily heavily indebted and the mortgage market is heavily heavily indebted, but we don't we don't blame people for that at the top. We just blame people for their debt and their moral failings at the bottom. And so I've been trying to figure out how we can put it all in the same conversation to say, like, everybody's in debt, but only some people are actually paying for it. And it's actually benefiting um, rich people to be in debt. And I, I don't know what to do with that either. It's just a, a thought. Yeah, Peter. No, I, I just... Uh... But I need very constant with that. I mean, Virgin Spanish is sort of scrolling out, kind of reading the souls of black folk again. Uh, and this theme about debt as a means of social control. Right? And that's just sort of tracing through historically, going into sharecropping, uh, and just sort of putting that on the table for people to be thinking about. I, I don't know, connect all the dots, but that seems to be an important through line where uh, institutional debt has always been used, or frequently been used, uh, as a means of social control. And I think the emergency manager is just the latest episode of that story. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah. Yeah, thanks for everyone on the panel. This was um, fantastic. Um, I think a lot about, um, I'm sorry, what's your name? You asked a question about, um, yeah, something. Uh, Raymond. Raymond. Yeah, I think a lot about <coughs> Raymond's question, and I think the context, right, that Catherine, right, like in, I'm um, in Mark and, um, and Louise are giving, right, like this, this kind of tension. Um, and I um, have had right, the great benefit of being to Lowndes County a couple of times and being able to talk with folks there, um, being from various areas, right, I've lived various areas in the South and have family roots here in Michigan. Um, and one of the things that um, sort of in my own work, right, I'm working with um, on black towns um, that were formed, right, to create, right, modes of self-sufficiency, right, um, to escape, right, the sort of 
um, as, as much as they could, right, the hand of white supremacy and to actually create their own sort of um, places for self-determination and self-sustaining. And I've interviewed a lot of folks who are from those communities, regardless of whether they are sort of incorporated municipalities or sort of unincorporated rural areas. And that theme, right, comes up over and over again, but that theme, the theme of self-determination, of figuring out um, how do we use the land that we have, right, to sustain ourselves in an economy where, as Catherine is talking about, right, like, we actually are not making, right, the kind of wages that would ever be able to sustain us on their own, um, by themselves. And so those, those narratives are always sort of like a both and. And one of the things that I keep coming up against is I'm like, yeah, like how do we get more, how do we get free, right? How do we get more sort of self-sufficient um, is like the, and I, you know, and I remember and I'm sort of snapped back to the reality that self-sufficiency um, in a capitalist system is technically illegal, right? Like it really is a, you know, it's, we find like small ways to like kind of carve out Right, like the Black Panther Party, right, like to carve out moments, right, and um, and spaces for us to try to get as much as we can. But there's always, right, there's always a backlash. There's always a clamp down right. on all of those sorts of efforts. So a case in point that happened in Eastern North Carolina, actually, at the church that, um, or one of the churches that uh, that Reverend Barber is affiliated with was trying to work with an organization, a nonprofit organization called um, North Carolina WARN um, that works on energy, um, future sort of alternate energy sustainability, um, to figure out, and this is a rural church, um, to figure out how to reduce the power bills for that church because Duke Energy, which is the devil to us in Durham, right? Um, you know, is would be a miracle worker, right? In a place like, um, in places like Eastern North Carolina, because they have the smaller um, power utilities that bilk them like five hundred dollars a month, right up to a thousand dollars a month during the winter times for their um, for their energy bills. And what the the church had in mind was to buy, because they couldn't afford to buy solar panels by themselves, was to buy solar panels from NC Warren and have NC Warren act as um, essentially like a third party like energy provider. They pay like whatever if there's any other sort of bills, they're sort of paying off the um, the uh, the solar panels over time, and then they get the benefit of the energy. And if that worked, they could expand it to the community. Right. Self sufficiency, right? Well then, you know, not, I don't even know that this experiment lasted six months before Duke Energy came and filed this huge lawsuit, right, against this church, <laughs> um, saying that, you know, it had the monopoly on, um, on sort of energy production and you couldn't have just sort of a willy-nilly like um, third party energy provider, right? And so um, in very short order, right, like everything was nipped in the bud and the, the nonprofit was just sort of faced with like dissolution um, if it did not, right, sort of relent and kind of um, back off from this plan. Um, and so I just, I say all that to say is like, I think that like, um, like this is the tension that we're dealing with, right? Like the, the trying to wrest, right? Like power from private companies' hands, which is basically hand in hand, right, with government at this point, mm -hmm. right? To, to get ourselves um, sufficient in some kind of way. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, I think that's something we all are having to like, to grapple with is like, oh yeah, like part of capitalism is like, <laughs> like you actually have to have the people like, as the resource, and if they are their own resource, then like capitalism dissolves. So that's like the way out, but then also like the huge fight that we, we find ourselves in. In Detroit, the churches had the drainage fees that they didn't know about. They implemented those. For the drainage fees, and the churches said, what are you talking about? Drainage fees. They make them up. They make up stuff. And you lose your prop. They make stuff up. They made up drainage fees. And people had their pay and um, they make it up. So right. that's what they do. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, I, we spend a lot of our time at the Bog Center trying to create the future. But I think we have to acknowledge there is no self-sufficiency anymore. Nobody's going to get out of this unless we all get out of it. That's just the truth. 
And just like they, you know, this business of as, as weak a political power as the black church has become, no offense to anybody here, but there was a time, but not now, they are still the only stable institution left in Detroit where people can gather, and in five years they're going to be gone, most of them. And they're going to do it with the water bills, right? the drainage bills. That's what's happening. It's right in front of us. We have got to understand that these small projects are important as experiments for the future, the same way Benton Harbor was a way they're experimenting for the future. We have to do that, but it is urgent, urgent that we figure out collectively our survival now, because they're not going to let one and two of us go anymore. And also, you know, there's something called climate gentrification. Uh, they're starting to see it in some places already, and they're saying that, for an example, like one example in Miami, uh, you know, Miami, there's suffering from sea level rise, and I'm very interested in climate change, and I've, I, I have recently uh, been elected to the board of the Climate Reality Project, which was set up by Al Gore. And, uh, and even in his, his latest movie, uh, an inconvenient sequel they show where in Miami and when it's a clear day you can see uh, fish in the street because of sea level rise. Well the areas in Miami that have the uh, that have the highest ground is a little Haiti. <laughs> so you know what that means. There's gonna be and that's that's gonna be climate gentrification. They said in California, you know, we in California the biggest problem is uh, are fires. The areas that are more stable, when they don't have a lot of fires, are Compton and Carson. Because they don't have those problems there. What is that going to mean in the future? So uh, I'm saying all this says we look at how we can be sustainable or how we help each other. we got to look at some of these policies. Because in Florida, I was talking to someone from Bethune-Cookman last night, and she said that they made it illegal to even talk about climate change in Florida. Whoa. You know, North and, and, and you can, North Carolina too, where you can't, and in Alabama, you can't even put, if you put solar powers on your house, you gotta pay $5 per kilowatt hour for each kilowatt hour that you generate off the grid. So they do that to keep people from being self-sufficient. We're talking about a system that's not designed for self-sufficiency. And what they're doing, a lot of these bills are being written by ALEC, which is paid for by the Koch brothers. And they're doing this so they can maintain control and keep and make more money, because that's the bottom line. They're not concerned about humanity. So in Alabama, which has lots of sunshine, I'm sure when I go back home it's going to be at least 77 degrees. In Florida, same thing, the sunshine state, you can't even use solar power, because they've outlawed solar panels. So again, as we start talking about these experiments, or however, whatever you want to frame it as, we have to start figuring out ways in which we can get more control of the process. Now, Michael Moore said the other other day that the largest group of, that there were 100, 100 million people that didn't even vote Whoa. in the 2016 election. And, she, and he, he laid out how many people voted for Hillary Clinton and how many people voted for Trump. The biggest group didn't vote at all. And if we keep this that same trend, we're not going to have any rights before all is said and done. Because I see parallels between them taking away people's rights, a homeowner, to put a solar panel on their house. I'm going to put one on mine. I'll probably be on the news. Because it's my house. And somebody's going to have to stand up and fight it. But the, the bottom line is that we're going to have to all find a way to get involved and make changes, whether it's about water here, Solar in, in um, uh, solar in, in Florida right. or in, 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 in New York, if you go to Harlem, Harlem isn't even black anymore. It's been gentrified. Oh, yeah. When I go to D.C., everybody in D.C. was talking about how they can't afford to live in D.C. Right. anymore. It has changed as well. So, and, that's, and, and I'm starting to see the same kinds of things take place here in Detroit. 
because when I go downtown Detroit, it doesn't look like it looked when I was here from 1997 to 2000. And I'm seeing new housing stars, and I'm seeing people walking dogs, and I'm sure they have bike trails, and things that generally goes along with gentrification. One more question. Okay. Um, I like that, and one of my precious life experiences has been the time that I spent with Rose Parks. And so I look at the dynamics of Rosa Parks coming from Montgomery to Detroit <coughs> and that connection is that, and a lot of lessons learned. One of the things that is really, really uh, uh, difficult for me is the whole idea of the silence, and particularly the silence of white people. Mm -hmm. And I always say silence is violence. Mm -hmm. And so we have had people look at all of these things that have happened. And it has become the norm. Mm -hmm. So the disconnect from humanity sits with mm -hmm. the people who have the power, who created mm -hmm. me as less than human. Uh -huh. And is that acceptable? So I always say to people, now that you know what you're going to do. Right. And so we cannot, we cannot do this alone. It has to be the we. Mm -hmm. And I always tell the Rosa Parks story that when they came to arrest her, she sat down on when she stayed in her seat, she was not planted by the NAACP, although that is the lie that's told, and Mrs. Parks would always correct it while she was living, so I continue to do that as her, one of her legacies. She said to the policeman, why do you treat us this way? She didn't say, why do you treat me this way? She said, us, because she thought of everybody else that looked like her that had that experience. So when you think about the water, and you point to Flint, and you point to Detroit as the shadows, it's coming to you. Mm -hmm. Michigan State already said that it was going to happen in five years. They upgraded their study. In, in three years, 35% of this country will not be able to afford water. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about water affordability, mm -hmm. and Alice Jennings has led a national team of 14 attorneys for legislation for clean, safe, affordable, accessible water as a human right. right. It's not a human right right now here in this country. Mm -hmm. So if we don't get it as a human right, we have our state legislature who has sat on the bills that we put forth. I put copies back on the table of both the federal and the local legislation that we're trying to get through. They wouldn't pass it. So when I, I wanted to put to the panel the issue of the legal system and how the emergency manager management law is an example of it, but it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which we now have the imbalance in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. that the courts are being used against us time and time again. The Voting Rights Act was completely mm -hmm. not gutted and annihilated at this point. So why is it that we have citizens who say that they are activists and they're anti-racist, but the action that goes with being anti-racist requires you to do something. There's no passivity in being anti-racist. It's, it's not about reading books, but these laws that are coming against us and how they can use the law continuously and our public health is being impacted because the, all of these things that happen when you can't wash your hands and you go out to your little non-paying job and you serve food after you haven't washed your hands, what happens? You're exposing the other people to it. So all of us are vulnerable. When they mess with the air, the air falls on the water. When they mess with the land, the land goes into the water. So if we don't recognize that water impacts us all, racism, white supremacy affects us all, racism from the beginning of this country was economic system. Mm -hmm. 
That's what it was. Economic system was not about all of these things that we think. We are the people of the global majority. White people are not part of the global majority. They're the global minority. When you look at people all over the world. So we need to speak out collectively. If we're not a we, <coughs> we're going to be. That's right. Amen. Amen. And thank you for the invocation of, of collaboration, yes. which we all have to be invested in. Um, if one of our questions was, what is emergency management a case of, um, we've heard many answers, including, and this is not a complete list, racism, racial capitalism, settler colonialism, neoliberalism, precarity, indebtedness, immiseration, resource extraction, labor exploitation, de-democratization, uh, white supremacy, um, what Bernadette Atahuene calls state graft, what the Honorable Joanne Watson has called ethnic cleansing, what Mark Fancher here called war. Um, tomorrow, we will uh, um, be continuing this discussion. I invite all of you to come to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor to join us. I want to thank the panelists once again for an, incre an incredible start uh, to, to, to this.